conservation specialist and NRCS partner biologist. I've been here in Texas for about two years. Um, I'm stationed in Fort Worth, but thank goodness they don't do this as much as they used to, but I get sent up to North Dakota on that now and again. So actually my, my home range covers the North American part of the home range of the monarch butterfly, which is pretty fortuitous for me, I guess. Um, so first, I'm going to test you guys. Raise your hand if you've heard of the monarch butterfly. <laughs> okay, either we've got a few reticent folks or a few liars, but it uh, looks like most of you are on the same page. Now this is a trickier question. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Yosin Society. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. I know that um, a lot of times I forget to introduce my organization and folks will ask the host later. So, the Xerxes Society, are they named for that Persian emperor? And I'm like, no, <laughs> we're named for an extinct butterfly. And in fact, it was the first butterfly to go extinct in North America due to human activities that we know of. And that happened back in the 40s near naval base expansion in the San Francisco Bay Area covered the entire habitat of that little blue butterfly with concrete, and so in one construction event, we lost a species, and the Xerxes Society was formed by Brinkle Lepidopterist in the 70s, who took that name in memoriam, because their mission was to ensure that didn't happen again. So that's about me and my organization, but today, we're going to talk about monarchs, and first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about why they've been receiving so much uh, coverage lately. I'm going to talk a little bit about their biology. That's why I call this a monarch one-on-one. -on -one. And then I'm going to talk about threats, and I'm going to end on conservation efforts. So we, we have historical estimates are a little fuzzy, but we think somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion monarchs used to make the trip from Canada to Mexico. 2013-2014, uh, lowest migrating population ever recorded at 33 million. Um, we had a little more than that last winter, technically double, still 60 million compared to a billion, that's pretty low. So we're seeing a 90% decline, and that's just in the 20 years that we've been tracking it. Who knows what happened before then? So that's, this is a real, this isn't something that the media has made up. This is a real decline <coughs> that you can see pretty dramatically here. Um, again, this is that all-time low of 33 million monarchs. You'll see here it says 0 0.67. That's 0 0.67 hectares. Again, this is 101. So the way that we count monarchs is we don't chase them with nets. They have a social roosting behavior over the winter in the Oyama fir forest west of Mexico City in the highlands. And when I say social roosting, they all will cluster on the trees in clumps that are called shingles, and it helps them use less energy over winter so they can survive to breed and migrate north. But at any rate, the entire eastern population in the winter of 2013 to 2014 only occupied 0.67 hectares. This past winter, we doubled that. You can see it's still pretty low, 1.13 hectares, which is less than three acres for 95% of the world's monarch butterflies, the eastern population. So this is why there's been a huge top-down push from the feds. This is why it's been making So that's, that's why y'all are here today, but now let's talk a little bit about monarch butterfly biology. So it is this migration that makes them special. And uh, Texas, we are called the migratory funnel for good reason. We are hugely important for both the first generation returning from Mexico and the generation that passes through Texas on the way to their overwintering grounds. Um, as you can see, we do have a few little outlier populations. We have this non-migratory population in <coughs> Florida, about 500, can everybody hear me okay? I didn't check. All right, we have about 500,000 monarchs that migrate to the coast of California, but 95% of the world's monarch population is this eastern population that's threatened. Uh, typically, so this whole migration starts in mid-March here in these glacial remnant OML fir forests west of Mexico City. They break dormancy, wake up, breed, and then this first generation recolonizes Texas. <clears throat> and they lay eggs and then they die. And then it's their children that colonize Arkansas and Kansas. That's another generational step. And so on and so forth for anywhere from three to six generations until they've recolonized all of their North American range. Um, so they're typically, they're hitting up here by midsummer. So June, July, August. I mean, they, 
hang out and breathe before they start <coughs> migrating down again in late September. So I believe they normally hit North Texas in mid-October, and traditionally they're believed to return to their overwintering grounds around November 1st, and so that's the annual cycle. Texas sees them in late March and April, and again in late September and October. So that long range migration is one of the reasons that the monarch butterfly is unique, um, but it's also, <coughs> this, this migration is made possible because they have two divergent life paths. And these butterflies that have these two paths, they have the same genetics, it's entirely triggered by environmental factors. And what that is is, these butterflies that are making these slower hops north to recolonize the North American range, they live a standard butterfly life. They emerge, they hatch, they develop, mate, breed, die. And all that goes down about maybe a month. And, but it's these monarchs that are born up here <coughs> in the northern plains. They live for six to nine months. And so again, same genetics, it's just environmental cues. It would be like, I don't know, your great great granddad <coughs> lived to be 500 and then migrated. Do any more <laughs> okay. And then performed a migration back to your ancestor homeland they've never seen before. So that is why the monarch is remarkable. <coughs> so, other than that, they're a normal butterfly. They have four life stages egg, larva, chrysalid, adult. And um, they take about a month to go from egg to adult with five inch size. This is why you see lots of different sizes of monarch caterpillar when you're out looking at your milkweed leaves. These first guys are really easy to miss. So they don't even look like monarch caterpillars, but these guys are pretty chunky and slow. So most of you are probably more familiar with the wavering stars. And like most butterflies, they have two types of principal feet. Most of you are probably aware that monarch caterpillars are larval, their larval host plant is the milkweed, and that's in the genus Astrutius. Um, they specialize on this genus because they incorporate the cardiac glycosides or cardenolides into their bodies to make them less palatable to predators. However, the adults are generalists. They do have some preferences, so they like <coughs> Gay feather, Eliatris, or Blazing Star, whatever you call it, in particular Eliatris, Lagius stylus, others. But generally, if it's a high quality nectar plant, they'll probably visit it. So you've got <coughs> young that eat milkweed, and the adults that feed <coughs> on the nectar. I'm going through this fast because I have a lot of slides. Let me know if you need to slow down. So that's basic monarch biology, is these two characteristics, this odd, generation that can live for six to nine months and go back to the ancestral overwintering grounds and then this this huge migration from Canada to Mexico. Those are what makes them pretty unique. However, other than that, they're a butterfly. Historically, we blamed Mexico for the decline of the monarch, and that's because the area where they overwinter, it's a glacial remnant forest. It's pretty constrained geographically, and it's in an impoverished region. And so you do have a lot of illegal logging. Um, and you know, it's essentially subsistence farmers. I was hearing, I was actually just in Arkansas earlier this week, and there was a guy who was doing some of the original monarch research. It was essentially one tree is a month's food. So it's really hard to argue with that. So historically, we were blaming these impoverished Mexicans for logging these glacial remnant forests. And that certainly had some impact, however, Logging has stabilized. There's still some of it that's going on. These are the original biosphere reserves. This is the current boundaries. Logging is still going on, but it's stabilized. But we're seeing, particularly in the past 20 years, pretty dramatic declines in the monarch. So what's going on? Well, recent modeling suggests it's actually us. Uh, recent modeling suggests it's actually the <coughs> loss of milkweed in the upper Midwest that could be driving this decline. And in particular, it's where in the past 20 years, we've had the, abil the ability to do clean cropping. So what that means is 
you've got a crop field without weeds, um, which in the upper Midwest, milkweed historically has been pretty resilient. Um, typically, you take a hoe to it and it comes back with six more stems. However, it is very susceptible to glyphosate. It's inhibited with glyphosate a few times and you're probably going to kill the plant. So, unfortunately, that means that in between about 2000 and 2010, there was about a 60% decline in available milkweed in the upper Midwest. Which, as you can see, um, I was talking to a man in Arkansas and he was asking me if all the factors leading to the monarch decline are the same, why are they, why are they declining more now? And what I had to say is it's not all the same. Uh, we didn't have clean farming back before the mid-90s. And so this is just a graph showing how this incipient technology has come to dominate the market, leading to these huge declines in available milkweed. It's not just milkweed, though. Um, something that I believe happened that winter where we had the record low numbers is if you get <coughs> a very cold, snowy, wet storm in those overwintering zones, you can lose half the entire monarch population in a storm. So it's not just the loss of milkweed. There are other factors that are contributing to this decline in the breeding population in the upper Midwest. So, you know, here, say we don't have any nectar plants available for returning monarchs in Texas. That is one stem contributing to this population. That's the thing with these long, long migration events. You break one link in the chain, the chain is broken. It doesn't matter where the break happens. So, you know, it can be milkweeds in the upper Midwest. It can be lack of nectar plants in Texas. So all of these are So that's the bad news. <laughs> but now I'm gonna take you through some of the stuff that's actually happening now in terms of conservation. And this is a pretty exciting week for me to be giving this talk because as I said, I'm a partner biologist with the NLCS and we had our monarch initiative rollout earlier this week. Um, a colleague of mine gave a couple of webinars on that that I believe were recorded so you can watch them online if you wanna learn more about the details of that rollout. But you can say three world leaders got together to talk about butterfly so that's a pretty that's a pretty big step that was in 2014 and also in 2014 we had the presidential memoranda which was a really exciting time for me to be working for in partnership with the federal government so I believe it was honeybees pollinators and then monarchs were actually specifically mentioned in this as well and what this particular memoranda did is it was essentially delegated tasks. So here you can see that Fish and Wildlife Service developed a high-level monarch working group. I believe we're gonna look at one of their products later in the presentation. USGS is developing a recovery plan. Forest Service is doing the assessment. And then USDA or the NLCS, which I partner with most frequently, we're providing conservation incentives. And the reason that this particular branch is most important in Texas is because we're something like 96% private land. So providing conservation incentives to private landowners becomes very significant once they work hours. So again, this is, I work most closely with NRCS and we have these two basic goals of increasing milkweeds and keeping the milkweeds we already have, and then at the same time increasing native nectar plants. I will say that in Texas, because we don't seem to have a dearth of milkweed here, that's more of a northern problem. So what we're focusing on more here that will probably be good news to your ears is improving prairie health. And so that is what we're focusing on here in Texas because we don't, we don't have low, a, a pure dominance of low crop ag the way we have in Iowa. And so we do have some semi-natural land that we can just improve management on to increase biodiversity, increase abundance of forbs, nectar plants, and then increase abundance of milkweed, the larval host plant. So in the north, while they're going to be focusing on things like conservation cover, <coughs> planting for upland birds and stuff like that, down here we're focusing more on things like <coughs> prescribed grazing, prescribed <coughs> fire, brush management. So those are the conservation practices that will be used most frequently down here in Texas. So I was referring earlier uh, in conversation with some of y'all to a heat map talking about conservation priorities. And as I, uh, I didn't mention, but we have different strategies for the north and south because of the different 
status of milkweed on the landscape, but the management for the South, we're going to apply to Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas. <coughs> management for the North is Missouri, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. Um, this map was generated from data in a year where most of the population of monarchs that were overwintering came from here, so that's why this has an outsized influence. However, uh, the NRCS does recognize the importance of Texas to the migrating monarch. Obviously, we're the funnel twice a year. If they die in Texas, then they're not going to make it to Mexico and they're not going to make it to Canada. So these are the areas that are being specifically targeted within Texas as areas for monarch habitat improvement. So that's what the NRCS is doing. Um, World Wildlife Fund for a long time has been working to preserve those roosts west of Mexico City where they have this, I don't know, can you see this picture? But they're monarchs just hanging on these trees. It's a shame that it doesn't show up better. Okay, so let's see. Can I do a point? Okay, so this is some of that shingling behavior. See, they're like forming these plaques on the branches of these ancient firs so they can they conserve energy for the winter. So, and that is why you can get an estimate of their population by measuring the area approximately that this roost is covering. All right. So, so two strategies is for one, we need natal habitat, and natal habitat in this case means milkweed and then we need to improve overall ecosystem health. Um, Xerces Society back in 2010 started the Milkweed Project because we recognize that native milkweed is largely unavailable especially in the south. Uh, upper Midwest you have a number of retailers who can provide you with various milkweed species. Unfortunately in the south we just don't have that capacity yet and so we're working on it but back in 2010 we partnered with various native seed producers to try and increase the capacity. So that's one strategy. And also a result of that project is this online tool, Milkweed Seed Finder. Um, it's probably one of our most popular website links. You type in your zip code and it spits out some local providers for you. So if you're wondering how to find milkweed seed, this is one way to go about it. I believe it was my team, my colleague Brianna Borgers who put in partnership with NRCS, we also have these resources available. These are documents telling you more about native milkweed specific to our region. We have a central United States document. These are available free online. Um, they're hosted both by the NRCS website and our website. And again, I recommend taking a look at these if you want to learn more about native milkweeds. It's free. Can't beat that. But this this book here, if you're trying to grow milkweeds, this is something that we put out just essentially gathering all the information that my colleague Brianna Borders had accrued in her years of service on this project. So how to grow milkweeds. And what I find most useful about this document, which is also available free online, <coughs> is the appendices, because she combed the literature looking for examples documenting milkweed usage by monarchs, and so you can take a look at the appendices, go down the list, if it's bolded, then it says a monarch has been documented to use that milkweed. I often get questioned which milkweed is better. That's a good place to start, this particular document here. Can you summarize a little bit the address for these places? I mean, yeah, well, so Xerces.org is a good place to start. Okay. Um, there is a lot on that website, so I might actually, my first step would probably be Googling milkweeds as conservation practitioner's guide, and this would be one of the top hits, but it's a pretty sizable PDF. I think if you printed it out, it would be like 150 pages. But like I said, it's just chock full of information. It's Brianna's magnum opus. <laughs> so this, um, here we have pollinator <coughs> plants of the central United States, native milkweeds. I believe we have since released a South Central pollinator plants, but we, if you go to xerces.org resources, we have a clickable map, 
And so if you click the South Central region, you'll find links. NRCS also has some of these available on their website. So if you Google NRCS pollinators, it'll take you to their pollinators portal where a lot of these PDFs also reside. So. So, you know, it's, um, I believe that what Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS has decided is a stable population of monarchs. The floor for that is six hectares overwintering in Mexico. And that is obviously, that's less than the billion monarch that we were talking about 20 or 30 years ago. But we think if we can reach six hectares of overwintering monarchs, then we will have reduced the risk of the extinction of this biological phenomenon to as low as 5%. So that's our goal. Um, that's our first goal. Again, that's not monarch population 30 years ago. What we're trying to do now is stabilize. But, but we're, we are, there are a lot of people who are dealing with a lot of their time in particular. Well, some of our monarch joint venture has been a great <coughs> partner. I know a lot of folks at the Central Tech Center for the NRCS is probably taking 80% of their time right now, so we do have a lot of people working on it, and we have all of you folks here who are learning about prairie health, which in the South Central region is one of the most important factors supporting the monarch butterfly. So. Have you heard any numbers yet for this year? Or when will, do you know when that number comes well, out? Well, um, that will come out probably in February, but yeah, they've just started arriving in Mexico in early November, <coughs> so they're still arriving. I know some folks are saying that they're still passing through, but we won't have that number until Late winter. Um, in Houston, we read that we should maybe cut down our Mexican milkweed, which is everywhere if you've ever planted it, uh, top of the game, in October, so to encourage the monarchs to keep going south and to reduce the parasite. Or right. That we, is, is that, it's really hard to do when we see all these monarchs coming into our garden. Well, you know, what I would do is. Okay, so there's this Astupius terrasabica, I believe, or tropical milkweed. It is native to Mexico and part, point south. It is a perfectly fine food source for larval monarch butterflies. However, it is evergreen, and because it is evergreen and it doesn't die back to the ground, it can accumulate pathogens, in particular this protozoan OE, which has a very long time to remain in the ground. And so that's the controversy is this plant can host monarchs, but it's not native and it accumulates pathogens. And so as you were alluding to, the general um, consensus right now is to, at the end of the migration, in order to not tempt these monarchs to break dormancy and start breeding, we should cut it down. And while that is certainly, that can be daunting if you have a large patch, I would still recommend it just because if you don't cut it back, you can accumulate more of this pathogen. Well, I can't say, I don't know how important the pathogen would be into uh, reducing the quality of the monarchs that are passing through. If it's, some, if it's at all manageable, just to be safe, I would go ahead and cut it back. You know, it's the problem is once you have KR groups, then it's hard to get rid of, you know, but we have partnered with a number of DSDs, and I know TechStop is interested in pollinator plants. Um, okay, but I know in particular, like, up in Iowa, because they are all crop, it is in fact the DOT that's doing the majority of the planting up there, because mainly they have those guys, so DOTs are working on it, but um, if, if the established culture is to plant grasses, that, that can be a lot of it. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, I mean, is there any other stuff? I mean, can, can you give like monetary incentives or something for tech stock to put in a different the, thing, non grass or put in more boards and pollinators? Well, you know, because they're government, uh, we can't give them <laughs> financial incentives, but they do have top-down directives to encourage pollinator habitat, and so it's just a matter of talking to those folks. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's similar to that. I worked with two guys who were like zone managers for textile projects and really thin to this <coughs> who runs it. So their goal is to hold the soil so they have to plant a lot of grass. But uh, one of the guys, a master naturalist, is really awesome. He adds a lot of wildflowers. There's another guy nearby who's not, and it saves him money not to, so he just collects all grass except for where it's along major highways where they have some of the humidification eventually leaves. So it depends who's there as well as to how receptive it is. It's, I guess like any government organization, you know kind of what their focuses are in that. But some folks do have a push that way. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you had your hand up. Um, this is going to sound weird in this room, but um, I'm asking for other reasons. If I had access to both a native milkweed, say tuberosa, versus the tropical milkweed, which gets sold everywhere, I would plant the fill in the blank. Native. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we're, I'm on the committee. We're having the committee meetings. So. Okay. On the tropical thing, too, I planted a butterfly weed, which is similar to tropical in Fort Worth, but monarchs have not flocked to it because it has a low neonicotory amount in it, but the tropical is like candy. Mm -hmm. The no, neonicotory supposedly has got a lot worse of it, it's not like candy to it. It's not because of the lead concentration that's turning them off. But I said the wrong word. That's, yeah, I got it. Thank you for fixing that. <laughs> yeah, but it's, um, I believe that tuberosa, it has hairy leaves, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the one? At any rate, it's not the cardenolide concentration, it's the essentially the feel of the leaves. It's harder for the caterpillars to get at and to get hair on it. So oh. that's what I've heard. Oh, okay. Yeah. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. But but because of that, and the monarchs are coming through in October in the Fort Worth area, it mm -hmm. seems to me like we should cut it down in, at, as soon as we see the first monarch. Before, af instead of after. Well, I haven't. So the thing is, while the bulk of monarchs do their breeding, over the summer, you do have something like 5% that break dormancy and will start breeding again in the fall. And maybe most years, all of those monarchs and all their offspring die. But on some years, that 5% is more important than others. I, I would say most years, those that break dormancy don't make it to Mexico. But if it's a native milkweed, which tuberosa is, I would trust it to go dormant at the appropriate time. So I wouldn't worry about cutting it back. It's the tropical milkweed that I would worry about because it's but, but should you do it in October in Fort Worth because we're further up than we get I, there? That, that seems reasonable to me. Like I don't have any data to tell you no, what the appropriate time is. Okay. Yeah, but I would say October seems reasonable to me, especially because you're already questioning that plant. Like I said, for native milkweeds as well, you would win. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Along the lines of the um, highway corridor, uh, is car traffic considered a threat? I had a colleague of mine up in Nebraska did her PhD research on pollinator corridors along highways, and if the if the habitat is good enough along the highway, then they're not going to be sticking around. And so you might have some incidental mortality, but it's still worth doing. I'd say it's still a net benefit to do roadside habitat. Um, any further questions? Just one. Um, you said that uh, one tree feeds X number of butterflies. Are you talking about those old firs in, in Mexico? Is that what they're eating? No, did I say feed? Well, I, I, meant, I meant host. Like host. They sleep well, you probably it. said host, and then I, I translated the wrong right. word. But um, what they're doing, they're, I mean, they might break dormancy and eat a little bit, but they're essentially just chilling out, waiting for good weather to return. And so they're resting on these oyamel firs for six to nine months, depending on when they arrive. And they might nectar if they're they might nectar periodically, but mainly they're just waiting and conserving calories so that they can break dormancy and breed and move north again in March. Sorry if that was unconfusing. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Just a clarification on that. Do they breed? Mexico before they return, or is that same generation that migrated south also return back partially north? Well, I've heard that they breed in Mexico. Essentially, when they break dormancy, I think the, the word the guy used was orgy <laughs> in Mexico. Um, so, I mean, they might still breed when they get to Texas, but there's a lot of breeding that happens in Mexico when they break dormancy. So, do, when, when they breed, do they uh, have a population in Mexico where they 
the caterpillars or do they do so that's a really good question it? and i'm going to go back to the map because you'll see but what you'll see on the map is a bunch of question marks and that's because for a lot of bio biological questions mexico is a black box so maybe you know, but we don't know because we've got a much higher density of monarch biologists in North America, <coughs> here north of Mexico, than we do south of Texas. And so they might be laying eggs along the way, but we could not, I could not verify. We, we have to remember that that plenary site was only discovered in what, 1976? Yeah, that's correct. So we didn't even know about this. We knew they went south, but but where they went after that, nobody knew. I, I What's spent funny, my, in Mexico, they knew they went north. Right. <laughs> <laughs> my, my wife and I spent our honeymoon there in the mm. 90s, so uh, we witnessed it, and it was unbelievable. Mm. I work with birds and fascinated with migration, and the monarch it, it takes the cake, it blows any bird away. Yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, there are plenty of unanswered questions. Um, we don't know with any certainty how these monarchs that were born up here in Minnesota all get the urge to go down to these overwintering grounds in Mexico and go to the same ones. You know, there's still a lot of mystery, though I would argue that this is one of the best studied insects we have. It just shows you. I know when the uh, Earth Force did their research, the monarchs, they found monarchs that died in Texas that they saw the year before. So they knew they went to Mexico and came back and didn't breed between there because I think it's known that they, as soon as they breed, they die. They have, I would disagree with that. Oh, um, really? Okay. Yeah, there have been, like Karen Oberdorfer did a study where females can continue to lay eggs for like three or four weeks. So, you know, she's continuing to lay eggs for three or four weeks. They can get from here to here in two days. So they could probably still cover a fair amount of distance. Oh, well, that explains it. Yeah. Uh, but are they still doing research to know where this numbered butterfly, they're still doing that, right? Where oh yeah, yeah. Um, actually, in recent years, they had an uptick in the number of uh, recaptures because they started paying people to turn in the tags. So you get five bucks a tag when you have people sending their kids up to the mountains to collect these fallen monarchs. So they're still doing, they're still doing the research. The problem is, we are really good at recapturing them when they all go to the same place, but when the monarch goes from here to here, 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 and it just spread out across an entire continent, that's, I heard of once a guy picked a tagged monarch off the front of a truck, you know, <laughs> but generally speaking, you're not going to find, recapture a lot of these monarchs. But, um, okay, and, um, I mean, we know that they gather over in that particular place. Is there a possibility that another gathering place for them or not in Mexico? Well, it's, um, there's certainly a possibility. It's more, it's not one roost. You know, it's uh, above 10,000 feet in these, this chain of mountains here in this particular forest type. And the roosts do move around a bit from year to year. I, you know, like I said, there are a lot of question marks on this map, so maybe there is another roost, but this is what we know about and this is what we can be sure I was there, uh, there were nine known canyons, and they, they had to have the, the right aspect to the, to the sun, the climate had to be just right, so we, they were like a, a pearl, a chain of pearls, so there, uh, at that time there were nine known canyons, and the, you know, I think most, if there were others, they would have been whacked, uh, so, yeah. you know, like you said, logging was a big threat. I saw some really heartbreaking pictures. There was a different conference I went to. Actually, it was the third pollinator powwow. One of the women who, in, down in Mexico who scouted some of these original sites was taking pictures of monarch roosts covering stumps of OML firs, which is kind of heartbreaking. But So they are particular to some extent. Um, however, these California monarchs roost just fine on non-native eucalyptus, so who knows? But, all right. 